you would be opening your Bibles to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 is where we will take our reading from this morning, 2 Timothy 2, we're going to read in verses 8 through 19. Paul tells Timothy, verse 8, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, and descended from David, according to my gospel, for which I suffered to the point of being bound like a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. This is why I endure all things for the elect so that they may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. For this saying is trustworthy. For if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. And so Paul had that bit of an aside on the overall point of the gospel. After telling Timothy how to suffer hardship in it and to seek his rewards thereby, he gets back to that main point uh, that he was going at in verse 16 before returning back to this idea again to summarize. Returning back to how to uh, be a good minister He said, remind them of these things and charge them before God, not to fight about words. This is useless and leads to the ruin of those who listen. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. Avoid irreverent and empty speech, since those who engage in it will produce even more godlessness, and their teaching will spread like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are among them. They have departed from the truth, saying the resurrection has taken place, and ruining the faith of some. Do your job well. He mentioned some who didn't. Then he goes back to summarize what he had said before. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. Bearing this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. The Lord knows those that are his. And let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. A summary of Paul's instruction to Timothy and an encouragement to do and to hold to the right thing. This last week, I went to a funeral. As uh, Every time I go to a funeral, I'm reminded uh, both of the words, and in this case, the actual complete truth of the words, of Ecclesiastes 7, where Solomon said it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting, because you'll learn wisdom, and it is good for the heart. And so, I was sitting in a, funeral this week, and these words came to mind, the Lord knows those that are his, and let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. And the reason why that was so was because the uh, minister who was presenting to us uh, the funeral, leading us in the funeral, uh, he was doing a very good job of preaching the gospel to us, really was. Uh, And honestly, I have to say, and maybe this is just my own Uh, mindset on this I thought surprisingly good job normally when I see somebody in that fancy of a robe with a collar and and the the really fancy stole and it was nice fancy stole when I see one of those guys stand in the shadow of a pipe organ I've heard a lot of things that haven't been very good gospel I've heard a lot of things that weren't about the truth of Jesus Christ this 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 man doing the funeral for a friend of mine in a neighboring community. He did quite a good job of presenting to 
the family and to those present, the unique comfort that is in Christ alone. In the way of Christ is the only way of salvation. And again, to see a man in that fancy a robe preach about the uniqueness, uh, uh, not, 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 not an inclusive gospel, but the gospel that's found alone in Jesus Christ. And again, as I say, for him to have done that uh, in that garb, in that setting, in the shadow of that pipe organ was very, to, m- to me and my uh, expectations and experiences, quite unexpected. Pleasantly. Pleasantly unsuspected, but, but unsuspecting. And then, of course, uh, the fellow with the kilt got up and uh, the, the, lone, the lone piper played Amazing Grace to end it all. But uh, anyway, quite, quite, a, quite a good funeral, I thought. Uh, but as he was preaching, I was thinking about this. The Lord knows those that are His. And the friend of mine for whom I was at the, the, the service for, I knew him to be a good man. I, I knew him through scouts. Uh, I, I know of uh, his concern uh, for youth. I know of his fidelity to a number of things that he did in life. But honestly, I don't know. I don't know about uh, his religious devotion. Uh, I, I honestly don't know anything about it. But the reason that came to mind is uh, this passage, the Lord knows those that are his. Uh, what this man's state before the Lord was, uh, well, especially now that he's gone, uh, nothing for me to do in it in any way uh, except to, uh, to think about it and to ponder for my own benefit and thought about it. Uh, but the Lord knows. And the Lord knows about all of us. Uh, the Lord knows uh, our situation, uh, each and every one. And other people, they may think they have an idea. Other people may see some fruit in our life that says, oh yeah, or oh no. But the Lord knows. And so as Paul was encouraging Timothy here to preach the gospel, we want to know what he took him to. Going back to verse 8 where we began to read, we have the gospel truth. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David according to my gospel. So the gospel I preach, Paul says, the gospel that I preach lays out these truths. And when he says my gospel, these are by my gospel, that that means is my gospel lays them out. The gospel I've been sent to preach by Jesus uh, puts these things uh, before the public and lets it all be known. It doesn't mean, well, just by my story. You've got your story, i got mine. That's not what he means. Now, when he says risen from the dead and descended from David, those are truth claims. Those were publicly known facts. At the time that this is written, around the year A.D. 64, 5, or 6, somewhere right in there, written a few years before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Timothy, if he'd had the time, an inclination and want to, he could have gone to Jerusalem and he could have checked those facts out for himself. Because what could every Jew do up until the destruction of the second temple? They could check their genealogies. And they could check the genealogies of any man. Today we think in you know, our modern times, oh, we, we've got Ancestry.com and we've got these other things that will uh, help you trace your lineage. We got nothing on Second Temple Jews. They, every one of them in the whole society, had their entire lineage all the way back to Adam available. You know, think about that. Because you think about in the, the beginning of the Gospels. The beginning of the Gospels in Mark and in Matthew. What do we find? We find the tables of genealogy. And we find that uh, Luke uh, takes us all the way back to Adam. Well, if we have and believe in the scripture, the good news is, is for free, I won't even charge you for this, I have the first 10 generations of your genealogy available. Right? Read the book of Genesis. From Adam to Noah, whose, whose genealogy is that? That's everybody's. 
Now, I got a few caps in between. I don't, I don't know. You know, once you get past Shem, Ham, and Japheth, it gets fuzzy in a hurry. And then so it's, you know, one, it's like one, one through ten, and we used to say as a kid, skip a few. And then I got the last three or four again. So I got the first ten, I got the last three or four. There's a little bit in the middle, it's a little fuzzy, but I'm pretty sure I have human ancestry all the way back. I can't prove that, but I'm pretty sure of it. And so it is with all of us. But Jesus and those generations of Second Temple Jews, as First Temple Jews as well, they could trace that genealogy. So when Paul says he's descended from David, that's a truth claim that in those days were checkable. It is, isn't it? Now, of course, descendant of David is not just that he was one of the myriad of people by the time of his birth who had David as an ancestor. Because David had a lot of children. Now, I realize Absalom did his good job to get rid of a few of those, but there were still quite a few survivors. And there was a lot of people who might have been just a descendant of David, but he's that peculiar descendant of David of whom the prophecies speak, he's the Messiah. And so there's more about his specific relationship to David. But that's a truth claim that's checkable. The same thing with risen from the dead. He was risen from the dead. The Apostle Paul, just a few years before he wrote this book, wrote a letter to the Corinthians. And what did he bring up to the Corinthians in the 15th chapter? A list of witnesses who saw Jesus risen from the dead. The apostles. James, the Lord's brother. 500 brethren at once, of Paul says, of whom many are still alive. So in the intervening 25, 30 years, there had been some death of the 500, but not of them all. And so Timothy could have gone to Jerusalem from Ephesus and could have made a little side trip to Galilee and asked about old men who saw Jesus alive and surely could have found some. So we start with the truth claims of the gospel. The gospel is about events in public, events that are known, events that are historic and true. And so Paul says we have a true gospel. And then he says we have a free gospel for which I suffer. I suffer because I preach this. These things are true, but I still suffer for them. Uh, Today, there's people who can speak several kind of inconvenient truths in the public squares of our towns and cities and get in trouble for them. And unfortunately, it seems like the number of truths of which that can happen is growing every day. But there are certain truths that are still true, even if you have to suffer for those truths. And of course, if you have to suffer for the truth, that probably means it's an important one. Right? It's one under debate and one under dispute. It's one that people would like to ignore. It's one that people would like to not be true. So I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. They've locked me up like I'm a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. And so Paul may not be free. But the gospel is. The gospel is free. The gospel was preached. The gospel was believed. The gospel was growing. There's a reason why they put some of the leaders of the gospel movement in jail. Because it was growing. You don't persecute the leaders of a dying movement. You don't persecute the leaders who are ineffective. You don't persecute those who have a truth or a story that's ineffectual. You persecute them when they are alive, when they are running free, when they are doing harm to your untruth by the truth. And so the gospel, the word of God, was not bound. And so people were being saved by it. Verse 10, this is the reason why I endure all things for the elect. God has made some choices. God has elected some. God has chosen some, to use another word of the same meaning. God has made some choices, and God has made some elections. God has made some determinations about who will be saved and who will not. It's always been that way. 
you know, if you, if you didn't go by God's choice, but by uh, the regular laws and choices of men, well, I guess first you would not have chosen Abraham. You wouldn't have chosen a man with no heir to have a great inheritance. Hard to have an inheritance without an heir. But he's promised a great thing. And then, though he had no heir for a very long time, and then he had an heir by his handmaiden. He had Ishmael. By every reason of the world, the child born to the master of the house, by the uh, handmaiden, uh, especially one especially sent for the purpose, that would have been his heir. And yet another 10 or 12 years after that, God said, no, it is the child I promised through Sarah, not the child that you have arranged through Hagar. And God chose the younger son of of Abraham, by a, a dozen years or so, he chose Isaac over Ishmael. We may come up with reasons why we think Isaac's a better choice, but the reason he's a better choice is because God chose him. And then we have, from the uh, uh, family of Isaac, now we have Jacob and Esau. And who did God choose? God chose Jacob, did he not? And when did he choose him? While they were in the womb. Before they'd done anything, the scriptures attest. And I have to say, if we study about the story of Jacob and Esau, we end up coming up with some reasons why Jacob was better. But I got to tell you, if we're honest about it, he's really kind of not. It wasn't about him being better. How did he get the blessing? Now, I know we, we, just, we, 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 we tell uh, the story on Esau, and Esau comes off pretty bad about the blessing. I'm, I'm about to starve to death. Give me something to eat. And his brother says, give me your blessing. And I'll, I'll do it. And what does the brother say? I don't care about the blessing. I need to eat right now. And we get on to him for caring so little about the blessing. But I got to say, didn't haven't other people in the history of God's people cared little about their blessing like that and still kept it? Yeah. And also, what kind of family is it where somebody comes in and says, I'm starving. And the first reaction is, oh, oh, please, here's some food. Take some food. But it's, I'll sell you some food. I mean, can you imagine? I realize we know some dysfunctional families, right? But how many families do you know where you go in and one brother sells the other brother some supper? Something's wrong there. And then how does he secure that which he, got, he, he gained first in that transaction, but he got then uh, from his father by doing what? How did Jacob get that from his father? By absolute subterfuge, by absolutely lying, by bringing a goat while his brother's out hunting for wild game, by bringing a goat from the yard while dressed up in his brother's clothes, disguised intentionally. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's, not by, it's not by merit that Jacob should have gotten anything. Uh, you know, by merit, they both were so disqualified. But God made a choice. And God said, I will choose these. And then, of course, Jacob with his family and his 12 sons, and which of those was the virtuous son to whom the blessing should come? Uh, no, never mind. Let's not talk about those 12 guys. Right? They, 10 are going to sell one. 10 are going to kill one. And only, instead of killing him, send him into slavery, into a foreign land. No, it's God made choices through that family. God made choices through that family. And, and there are those for whom, in the, that family that God dealt with from time to time, who were sterling people and were examples to generations to come, but not many. And most of the time, what they were were examples in a short time to the families and the people who would come. But God worked through them to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we might find the one in whom is salvation, the one in whom we can depend, the one in whom was faithfulness and trustworthiness for our benefit. And so, Paul says, I endure all for the sake of the elect. These are the ones that God chose. And you think about those at this time who made up the church. Those who had come uh, from various pieces and parts of the Roman Empire. Those who were Jews, who had been waiting a long time expectantly. Those who were Jews, but had not lived expectantly, but came at the call to repentance. Those who had been Samaritans, and those who had been pagans, and those who had worshipped all the other false gods, but God demanded to all men everywhere should repent, and some did. 
And of these, make a new group, this church, conformed out of the image of Christ for which Paul will do anything. I'll endure all things for the sake of the elect so that they may obtain salvation. So I, I teach, I preach, I pray. What, what did Paul do in, the thing, in all things? Right? He taught, he preached, he prayed, he visited, uh, he was persecuted as he did those very things, put in jail so they could obtain salvation. The salvation, it says, which is in Christ with eternal glory. So this is the object of the whole thing. So this is a trustworthy statement. If we die with him, we'll live with him. And so as Paul was put in jail as a criminal, he sees that others will die for the Lord. They'll be made martyrs. Others will fall asleep in Jesus at a natural time after a good long life. But they'll die with him either way. They'll die asleep in Jesus or they'll go copying the martyrdom of Christ. But if they die with him, They'll live with him. If we endure, and again, he, said, he writes this from prison. This enduring is not a hypothetical. The enduring here is the enduring of a man writing from a prison cell. If we endure, we'll reign. But if we deny him, he'll deny us. And so be with Jesus, the one who has eternal glory. Be with him who reigns. Be with him who conquered. You yourself need to conquer. You need to not come up short. You need to not deny him. For if we deny him, he'll deny us. If we're faithless, it doesn't say what will happen if he's faithless, because he won't be. If there's any question of faithfulness, it's on our part, not his. If we're faithful, he's, he remain, if we're faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Well, if we're with him, he won't deny us because that would be like denying himself. We are his family. We are his children. We are his purchase. We are his flock. He'll be with us. He cannot deny himself. But we need to make sure we stay in the flock. We need to make sure we stay in the confession. Don't deny him, but confess him. Now, at this point, as we said, Paul went to give some other instructions to Timothy. Remind them, charge them, instruct them, study so you can teach them properly. And don't be like these guys who run off into fruitless discussion. Don't be like those who uh, get into error, uh, saying the resurrection is gone and past. Don't ruin faith. Don't ruin the faith of people. Strengthen the faith of people. Don't be like Hymenaeus and Philetus. Right. So that section. And then he comes back to this. Summarizing this again as reason for Timothy to stay faithful and for us all to stay faithful. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. So here's God's firm foundation. Here is God's unassailable foundation. It's written on the foundation, like written into the base of a statue. And carved into the paving stones is this. Quoting from Numbers 16.5, the Lord knows those that are his. This is a statement from the time of Korah's rebellion. In the time of Korah's rebellion, Korah led a group of people who said to Moses and Aaron, you guys take on too much. You claim to be the leaders of God's people. We're all holy people here. We're all the people of God. And by the way, we think we ought to be the leaders of them. And Moses and Aaron said, all right, y'all show up the next day. And we're going to see who's God's people or not. And what happened when they said, we'll see who God's people or not is. Well, Moses and Aaron end up standing there and the ground swallowed Korah and those who most closely followed him. And so there was a point of decision, the, who is with the Lord? And if you're one of the people watching this spat, you may wonder how uh, Moses says he's with God, Korah says he's with God, Moses is and Aaron, uh, he's the spokesman, and Aaron's the high priest. But, you know, Korah, he's a priest too. Maybe there were some people who hesitated. Maybe there were people who were, were swayable. Well, we certainly seem to think that uh, a lot of the people followed Korah, because after Korah and his 250 was followed by the ground, what happened the next day? The people mumbled about that and grumbled about that, and God sent destroying serpents in and killed 23,000. 
So a whole lot more died siding with Korah uh, on the second day after he was already swallowed up than died within the first day in the great swallowing up. Normally you'd think the earth swallowing up 250 people, that'd be a notable event. Well, almost 10 times as many people die the next day because they sided with the guys that got swallowed up. Now, I think my family would probably, and some of my friends too, would attest to this, that I don't always have the greatest discernment to read what's going on around me. I'm not always the best guy to read a room. You don't have to, amen. That The nod is good enough. Thank you. But if God swallows them up, I think we can read that as God doesn't approve, right? Well, in this world, we should not be confused. Is that there are people who don't know who is with the Lord and who is not. If you just dropped in from another civilization, a non-Christian one, and you dropped into the United States of America, you dropped into Mulvane, Kansas, and you find out that more people here are Christians in this community than any other kind of religion. And you go, oh, well, maybe there's something to that. I should investigate it. And then you start going around to various groups of Christians here in this town or any other. And you go, well, what is this Christianity thing about? And on the basis of what people tell you, you've got to figure out, what is this Christianity thing about? What does it mean to belong to the Lord? And how should I serve him? I can't. Can you imagine trying to do that? Uh, Well, the people would go, well, which ones are with the Lord and which ones aren't? Well, the Lord knows those that are His. The Lord has no such confusion in regards to us. We have confusion in regard to Him, and many of our neighbors have deep confusion regarding the Lord. And they've been told many false things about Him and what He accepts and what He wants and what would be pleasing to Him or what would not. But the Lord knows who's His. Again, we're confused at times. He is not. The Lord knows those that are His. He knew even though Korah blinded many people and Korah made false and counterclaims, He knew on that day and He's known every day before or since who is with Him. So, remember, God knows. So when this guy like Hymenaeus and Philetus pop up, They say the resurrection's already passed. They destroyed the faith of some. Those people obviously didn't know that Hymenaeus and Philetus, they weren't with the Lord. But the Lord knew. And then the second part, and let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away or abstain from wickedness. So this is a good clue as to who's on the Lord's side and who isn't. Who practices wickedness? Who justifies wickedness? Or who encourages and teaches holiness. And so be faithful. So God knows and you be faithful. And one of the great ways to be faithful is not fall into the things of the world. Let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn aside from wickedness. That's a big key. A big helper to know who is with the Lord and who is not. So, remember, verse 8, the Lord Jesus, risen from the dead, descended from David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer, being bound like a criminal, but the words not bound, I endure for the sake of the elect, that they can obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And remember this firm foundation of the Lord, which has this written on it, The Lord knows those that are His, and let all who call upon His name turn aside from wickedness. And so with that, let us know and be assured. Let us understand that this gospel is true. This gospel leads to glory. These things are accomplished for and in and through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory. Lord, come quickly. And for us to know the Lord and to abstain from wickedness. With that, we'll close this morning with those words, thoughts that came from sitting at a funeral of a friend. Sad thing is, we have to keep going to funerals. Then one day, there'll be a last one for us to go to, and we won't even know we're there. Hopefully, there'll already be someplace else, and they'll come and remember us. But let us always know the Lord is true, 
and that we should abstain from wickedness to reach the home of eternal glory.